Greetings adventurous travelers and fellow keepers of the lake. Welcome to another Crown and Skull video. That's what you've been waiting for, didn't you, you all of you Crown and Skull lovers? Well, I'm baffled by the amount of attention that the cult video got and um, I don't know what to say. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Uh, I, I am glad you, you liked the cult video and you might be surprised like Cron and Skull, what is that? I'm, I'm here for edgy horror stuff. Well, there will be that, but there will also be uh, a lot of fantasy stuff, a lot of creative stuff in general. So if that's your thing and you're not subscribed, well, join us, join the Order of the Barlow Keep and become another Keeper of the Lane. Okay, with the intro out of the way, what is this video going to be about? Well, uh, a session recap type of thing and some cool stuff that I uh, come across and some things that didn't work so well for us. So I kind of mashed Crown and Skull together with a war game. It is a skirmish type of game based around Frostgrave and this is my first interaction with these types of games. So I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but it sounded cool on paper and we, we were like undecisive. Are we going to play Crown and Skull or are we gonna play the skirmish and my players were like why don't just like let's smash it together let's play both this is the story of what i came up with i will be intentionally vague in this video because both the the skirmish game is something that a fellow youtuber is working on and of course uh the crown and skull material comes from the hex uh, so last time uh, i had a comment that was like it is very um, complicated to take an NPC and have him battle alongside the players. Well, not complicated, but like there is no guidelines for it. And there are ideas on Discord, for example, uh, assign to each attrition uh, value a dice value and then bump it up or bump it down as you see fit. And Hankering himself responded with just handle it as a dm like just do whatever with with that um npc you can like uh, when you're on the other side of the dm screen you don't really need to ask a question did the frog person hit the i don't know werewolf you can just roll a yes or no die or just have an opposed roll or just say whatever makes sense for the uh, narrative um, of the fight you can have, for example, a timer after how many phases your NPC that is fighting alongside players will actually land a hit and his damage can be an average damage. You can like pretty much squash its stat block to a minimum. And and that's the, the thing that I think people from, from feedback that I've got don't really get. This is not something that will replace Pathfinder, D&D, your average game that has a spreadsheet that looks more like uh, your tax reports than, than a game. Well, this is more like a narrative tool and you would say, okay, but there is a lot of tactical stuff. There is a lot of like customization. Yes, but it is all in service to the narrative because uh, at, the, at the end of the day, if you are uh, more of a tactical person, you would not maybe enjoy Crown and Skull as much if you don't enjoy the type of challenge that might be seeming unfair. Like you do have the death spiral, let's face it. And if you start losing your armor, you will lose more armor and you fall into the death spiral, right? In that sense, I don't think that the solution is uh, from a tactical side, it's from the narrative side. And this is something that I think people are now struggling with the most uh, during play. And I would just uh, emphasize one more thing. There was a question, if you have attrition dealt to you and you have, for example, flash attrition and you have equipment attrition, are they the same health bar? Well, yes and no. In the book, you will see that it's referred to both skills and equipment as inventory, in a way, in some parts of the book. I will find it and put it on screen. But when then you look at like the, the meaning in some other places, it implies that if you don't have the skills to defend yourself, you're basically dead. If you don't have equipment to absorb uh, a hit, again, taking the hit to the heart. So. Which one is it? It's a debate. Hankering confirmed on Discord that if you have um, your skills depleted to, to nothing, you're done. And that prevents cheesing of the system where you just take more and more and more equipment and 
DM can't hurt you, the monsters can't hurt you because you're just patting yourself with sandwiches or whatever. So I don't know what would make sense to you in terms of like taking equipment uh, damage. So you're losing equipment and you don't have any more equipment pieces. Would you say it makes sense for you to start uh, depleting skills then? So if you take another equipment attrition, you actually cross off a skill because you don't have any more equipment to protect you. So now your skills are at stake. I think this makes sense. So basic attrition, cross off anything uh, you like. Uh, flesh attrition, cross off skills. If skills are zero, you are taking a hit to the heart. Then equipment attrition, which cross off one equipment part. If you don't have any equipment left, start crossing off skills. If you don't have any skills left, shot to the heart so i think yeah i i'm running it like that it makes sense to me um i've just noticed that i look into my laptop a lot and it's just a sound uh, wave thing just a sec okay doing professional youtube stuff here you have to look at the camera we, we trained eye contact for so long this is not real eyes this is a camera i'm standing like from action okay so i would love for this to be in the book and be like clearly explained but yeah, whatever. I, I think as with everything in this book, just use your DM mind, use your superpower and your players will like just be fine with it. It is not a min-maxers game where you're trying to win, uh, where the DM is your adversary. This is a game designed for people that want to create amazing tense stories together collaboratively, collaboratively. My players can't find a way to live without gold, without economy and without uh, loot. So now we are playing uh, here and there these hexes as one shots. I'm trying to make them all be connected, but I don't even have the same players all the time. So I still don't know what it's like to have a longer term uh, group for Crown and Skull and like mm, see how the long term play affects the, the feeling of the game. But as of now, uh, every group that I've had, they are like, we are used to having gold and coins. We enjoy the bargain. We enjoy that part of the game. I would say that the part uh, where you stop enjoying that is when you become higher level. So I would probably start introducing, and this is just for my game. I know this is not the, the official philosophy of the book, but I would start um, introducing gold back into the game. And I would certainly make uh, changes to how it is tied to the inventory uh, in a way that anything that is small, anything that is expendable, like a consumable or something like that can be bought by gold and goes into the pouch and can be only lost if you drop the pouch, which can be like the last part of the inventory that you lo lose. And if you drop it, all of the, like, for example, potions, they all break, something like that. I would try to... Mm, balance it a bit but at the end of the day I want them to be able to buy some stuff if you are buying something that is that is too powerful I would certainly like say you can buy it you have to bargain for the gold and in turn you would be bargaining for hero points now we are talking about I don't know, uh, 100 gold would be maybe one hero point in my opinion, because I don't want them to be one on one, like one to one uh, ratio. I want the gold to be much less valuable than hero points and hero points are like giving the power to the gold. So if you have enough hero points, someone might sell it to you for far less gold, but far more hero points. I'm still like, this is just me brainstorming. I came up with this here on the spot. so. It's not a guide to a mechanic by any means, but it's just me rambling and they hope I'm just with this rambling getting your brains to go into full-blown uh, branching paths uh, syndrome and make you come up with even better stuff. Right, so how did the session go? Well, actually, we had three players that haven't been playing Crown and Skull before and one player that did. We started with them finding each other in the forest and they were started to go like next to the river. I don't know what the name was, Tan, Tani, something like that. And it is, it is literally at the bottom of Stormkeep and next to Rivergate. So they were like fooling around in that forest. They saw the, uh, the threat that is looming and who read the hex, you know what I'm talking about. They ran towards the deeper forest and to, towards the river. 
and they came to the river, they sat into the boats, and as you know, like they have a bit of a bumpy ride, let's call it like that. After that, they uh, start interrogating the, this goblin, and I made like a modification to the hex where I said, uh, we have a literate goblin, and he uh, very much enjoys literacy, and he enjoys books. They are all enjoyers of books, so these are civilized goblins, unfortunately slaughtered by the, the looming threat and they actually bury their dead with their books so now players are um, like one of them had the invisibility and rolled pretty high so uh, she was eavesdropping on the soldiers and turns out they're looking for a book so the players like use their epic player logic to conclude that the book is probably the thing that the soldiers are looking for and that book is probably in the goblin graveyard so they went straight to the burial grounds of the goblins and there they had a small mini dungeon thing where they you know, went through it wasn't a mapless dungeon it was something that is just like a narrow corridor with like two traps or something at the end of that corridor um was the the mini boss um caster and for you that know his name and everything it's uh Saren the the druid and he was kind of mentioned by the army so i was like okay um if someone mentions his name if he, someone calls him by name he will actually teleport to that person and demand to know how you came to know his name and one of the players and actually the, the girl that never played uh this type of game rolled an opposed role with him to try and like snatch the staff out of his sands and as soon as she did so he turned to wood they went into his um like secret chamber in in that cave it is a hole in the wall covered by moss nothing special and they like entered in looked at what he has and there was like a bed uh, a couple of pictures of his kids and like his life before the the calamity of whatever uh, is canon in my world i will just leave it at that and we will talk about it some other time and yeah they found some books one of the books was his diary the other one was a magical book with like um almost like a book for kids you know those um you know those books with just pictures i don't know what that's called in english and they were like uh, looking at the pictures and it was a story about like a king that was so sad that um People are destroying nature and building stuff and he was like a king of elves or something. So he tasked the mage to find a solution. The mage uh, created a sword called Divine. Get it? Divine, like the, the, the plant. But if you say it fast, it's like Divine. So Divine Vine. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he made the Divine, which if you thrust this uh, sword into the ground where you have trusted it, it would stay there, but it would make almost a kilometer wide circle just spring up new trees and like accelerate growth and like make it lush nature. So the king dies and the two uh, sons are now battling each other to see who is going to um, get the sword. And I've said that as this player was reading this story, everybody else felt like they are starting to fall asleep, like something is changing in the fabric of reality, the magic, the and, and everything was so strong at this point, like almost as they are on a crossing of ley lines. So everything started to shift and they found themselves in like a almost drawn universe inside of the pictures. And they were the two brothers battling um for the sword and since i had two uh, boys and two girls playing i said your your brothers and their wives whatever so they were split into two teams and then we could finally use the skirmish map on the table so i gave them the rundown of the rules and you will see currently i have to stay secretive a bit you know but in the future you will find out what this was about this is an upcoming a rule set for skirmishes, something inspired by Frostgrave and maybe some other games, so stay tuned for that. And um, the rule set is so simple, it gets you going so fast, and there was a, a huge change in tonality. They started to be very tactical, very uh, like serious, it was all no more fun and games, now the battle is on, and we had a blast playing it. And what I've uh, concluded here is that war games not necessarily war games, but like skirmish games are very interesting in combination with uh, with RPGs because 
Because at this point, you are having a battle with another human being, giving you your best and he's giving his best. You are not um, taking into account the RPG elements and that is something that might be off-putting to you. Like, you cannot take a rock and throw a rock and like make it, put a spell on a rock and then throw it and it will like land somewhere, somewhere and make spiders appear. Uh, it is a very uh, balanced battlefield, so no hiding, no uh, enchanting stuff, uh, cheesing your way around things with rope and things like that, which is totally fine because you want the battle to feel fair and you want the victory to feel earned. So instead of going into complicated ideas of how I would uh, maybe run something like this, well, just use a skirmish type of game. Whenever you have a clash of, for example, forces, what I would do, I would literally uh, take, like, they're called warbands. I would literally take two warbands, and I, one would be run by the DM, and one would be run by the players, and I would give them the ability to have three generals in... If I have three players, I would give them three generals and we would play a skirmish game and that can decide maybe one front of like, I don't know, uh, a five front battle. We can have multiple these on multiple maps and then that could decide uh, how, for example, a, a big battle went. In the game we played, we had these two teams of players and I as a DM just sat and, and watched them play and that was still pretty fun actually because the the victory happened like so fucking i can't say that the team that was losing so hard won by such a tiny like mm, they were so close to to losing it was it was amazing so i had a blast we all had a blast and yeah war games in uh, in in rpgs interesting stuff and i know it, it is not okay for me to call them war games but yeah for me they're war games i've never played like warhammer for me <laughs> or Ninth season or whatever the name of that uh, game is. I've seen people play it, but I've never played it. I actually had a great idea and it was why I wanted to start this channel and it was to like try and take each board game I have and see how the rules of that board game can be applied to D&D or vice versa and how that would all, all work. But that takes so much time. I tried it with some games, uh, maybe did something like that is coming. So if you're interested, you know what to do. Begging for subscribers. Okay. Sorry. So that would be it for today. Uh, I hope this wasn't a boring one. I just wanted to take this off my chest. And as always, keep on going, keep on loving, keep on being creative, play more Crown and Skull, and I will see you in the next one. Farewell, keepers.